Um, so welcome to our office hours. Today is special education law for general education teachers. And if you can put your um, name, district, and position in the chat, we would greatly appreciate it. All right, so Colette is on screen today and I'm talking. So if it gets a little awkward, sorry about that. All right, Colette, let's go. <laughs> All right, so this is the monitoring and support team. I am Jennifer Gleason. Um, before I joined this team about three years ago, I was a special education teacher and an ed tech. And we can go to Colette. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, we are, like Jennifer said, we are having some technical difficulties, so we're going to make do. Um, my name is Colette Sullivan. I am the Federal Programs Coordinator. I uh, have been at the department for just five and a half years, I think. And before that, I was a special education teacher for 30 years, primarily students with autism. All right, Carly. Hi, everyone. I am Carly Thibodeau, and I am one of the members of the team. I've been on the team for about a year and a half, and before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Ashley. Hi, everybody. I'm Ashley Statry. I am the newest member of the team. Um, however, I've been here for almost nine months now. So um, I'm starting to recognize a lot of names of the people who join us in this. So I love that. So I'm um, happy to be here with you guys today. Great. And the person we could not live without, our Wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I am the admin support for the monitoring team. Um, I'm in my seventh year at um, the DOE, and prior to that, I was 16 years at a K-5 elementary school. Julie takes very good care of us. We literally would not know where we were without her. All right, so this is Special Ed Law for Gen Ed Teachers, and we are just doing it the very basics, um, keeping it light. I see a lot of people that are here are Special Ed people but I see Gen Ed people here too, so that's good. So we're gonna start with a very brief history of special education, and then we'll talk about just the basics, the core of special education. IEP team and meetings. We'll talk a little bit about accommodations and modifications and implementing the IEP, discipline, and then at the very end, we will have time for Q&A if you have questions about other topics. All right, we're going to keep this very brief, I hope. So history of special education, it's a little ugly. Um, so back in kind of Victorian times, and I mean, some of this continued way farther on, but people with disabilities were placed in lunatic asylums or the families kind of hid them in the house because they would be embarrassed by them. It, it was not unusual. Um, in Victorian times to just openly point and laugh at people who moved or looked different. Um, these words up here are ugly words, but those were the clinical terms that were used and there are more. Um, it, it was, it, it, it's an ugly history, leave it at that. Um, so in the first part of the 1900s, states started to pass laws making education compulsory. Um, so students with disabilities, if they were in the public school at all, they were placed in isolated classrooms and often there was no education going on there at all. And this beautiful lady, Callie, was born in Connecticut in 1955 with Down syndrome. She is the youngest of six children. One of those children is my father, so she's my aunt. Um, when she was born, the um, 
the doctors recommended that my grandparents institutionalize her as an infant. And um, they said she wouldn't live much past her 20th birthday. So my parent, my grandparents did not institutionalize her as an infant. But when it came time to go to school, the public school wouldn't take her. So at that time, and actually way beyond that time, um, students with intellectual disabilities um, were deemed either educable or trainable. And it was based solely on IQ. So Callie was deemed trainable and she was placed in a residential training school, Southbury Training School. This link, um, it's live on the PDF. It's a 60 minutes segment about Southbury Training School. Um, so she lived there and went to school there. She was able to come home a lot because it was just a couple towns over from my grandparents' house, um, but not a great place. So Maine has kind of an equivalent type of thing, Pineland. Um, you can see all the names that Pineland went through um, since its opening in 1908. And this link will bring you to kind of a history of Pineland. So just a, a little heads up if you click any of these links, it, it's a rough history. So make sure you're in a kind of a decent place to watch it because it's pretty ugly. So we get to 1971 and there was a lawsuit in Pennsylvania. Park um, sued Pennsylvania because they weren't educating students with intellectual disabilities, much like all the other states. So the court actually found in favor of Park and they said that yes, you have to, um, you have to educate all children and you know, it might be nice if maybe you educated them all together. You know, maybe you can educate those kids with disabilities with their peers. You don't have to, but you know, it would be kind of cool. So that's what the judge said. I'm sure it was different words. So then finally, 1975, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act was passed. And this is the law that says all public schools in the United States must educate students with disabilities. So kind of shocking that that didn't happen until 1975, but here we are. So in 1990, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act was changed to IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which we know now that's the law that we um, teach under. Um, IDEA was last reauthorized in 2004. Um, it's supposed to be reauthorized. I don't remember how many years, but it's less than 20. So, um, Then in 2017, there was a really big court case. Um, I like to talk about this court case a lot, but I'm not going to. I'm going to just um, let you click on that link. It's a Q&A put out by the U.S. DOE, and it's very readable Q&A about the Andrew F. case. But basically, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that um, the child's goals, the child with a disability, their IEP goals must be reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress. And every child should have the chance to meet challenging objectives. So this is really about, it's about progress, right? It's about um, making those IEP goals in a way that they can be achieved in a year. And then the next year, um, the child can move on and really show that this child is, is making progress, um, whatever progress is um, applicable in light of their circumstances. So now, as you know, I'm sure, we are talking a lot about inclusion right? Getting kids with disabilities in the classrooms with their peers. And this is a big thing. It's a big deal. And um, it's a very good thing. So we've come a long way in a short time, right? We came from lawsuits saying 
you know, hey, you're not educating these kids to, hey, let's include them in, in the classroom with their peers. So it, it's good, but we need to keep going. And Callie. So while all of this progress was happening, Callie was growing up and she was kind of riding the wave of this progress. She benefited from this. So um, as an adult, she moved around to different group homes. She had a variety of jobs. Um, she did a lot of piecework. I remember her making um, lipstick tubes, that kind of thing, just that piecework. And eventually, she was able to live in an apartment with a roommate, and she worked full-time at Ames. So this um, building is the actual apartment building she lived with, and that's her roommate, Ruth. And that little guy she's holding, by the time Callie passed, that little guy was a junior in college, and Callie was 59. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, um, Kelly was 59 years old when she passed, so the doctors, <laughs> doctors have said she would only live till 20 or wrong. <laughs> Sorry, but... <laughs> Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. And how, how tall is that little dude now? That little dude is 6'3". <laughs> yeah, 6'3". Don't apologize for uh, this. Is this is this is real? This, this, this yeah. Is good. Okay. Let's move on now. <laughs> All right. Basics. Let it get into the real nuts and bolts of basically what is special education. So there we go. Oh, acronyms. See, we all we're all in education, so we all know these live acronyms. So I kind of split this out between, I kind of tried to line up the federal and Maine. So USDOE is the United States Department of Education and the counterpart in Maine is the Maine DOE. OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programs, um, that's federal. And we, from Aussie, Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education, we have to report to OSEP. OSEP, um, their job is to enforce IDEA, make sure the states are compliant with IDEA. And we are responsible for collecting that data and sending it to OSEP. So when you see us in your district, that's what we're doing. Um, and this team actually visits the whole state of Maine, every SAU over a four year period. IDEA, we already talked about that. That's the federal law. And its counterpart in Maine is MUSER, Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. So the states can go a little further than IDEA, but IDEA is the minimum. You can't take things away from it. We will talk a lot about LEA. LEA is the local education agency. That's you, that's the SAU. In Maine, we call them SAUs or CDS as an LEA as well. So all of the SAUs, LEA. SEA. That's the Department of Education, State Education Agency. And you all know, I think, what an IEP is, the Individualized Education Program for Students with Disabilities. So I'm sure you'll remember all those. So basically, this is very basic how IDEA works. I When, um, when laws are made that say, hey, you have to do these things, it has to be funded, right? So... The US DOE sends money for special education to Maine, and the Maine DOE sends that money to the SAUs. But in order to get that money, you have to show that you've been compliant with IDEA and also MUSER. So uh, we go into the SAUs, make sure you're being compliant, and then we report um, to the US DOE that, yes, we're compliant, so we should be able to have our money. All right, more acronyms, sorry. Um, so really the core of special education, really the, the nuts and bolts is that students with disabilities must be provided FAPE in the LRE. 
So FAPE is a free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. So we can break that down a little bit. So free appropriate public education, this is right out of IDEA and all of these are not all of these links, I don't think, but the top link is live. So you can click on that and actually it'll bring you to this part of IDEA. So a free pub appropriate public education provided at public expense under public supervision and direction. So that's kind of um, if you have students who the SAU says, you know, this student's disability is really um, profound and we, we are not equipped to educate them. So we're going to pay this special purpose private school. We're going to pay them a tuition and they are going to educate this child. What this means under public supervision and direction means that the SAU is still responsible for FAPE for that child, even though they're not physically in those public schools. They are in a private school, but the public schools, the public district is still responsible for them. Um, the SAUs need to meet the standards of the SEA, so that's MUSER including the requirements of this part, which is IDEA. So compliance with both MUSER and IDEA. Um, you have to provide education at all ages and in conformity with an IEP that meets the requirements of IDEA. And IDEA spells out exactly what needs to be in an IEP. So that's FAPE, FAPE in the LRE. So this is least restrictive environment right, to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities are educated with children who are non-disabled. So as much as they can be with their peers, they need to be with their peers. And also the second part is something that when special education teachers are writing their IEP, they have to kind of defend this. They have to write something that that addresses this second part, right? So removing children with disabilities from the gen ed environment can occur only if the nature or severity of the disability is such that education in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. So it, this is a big deal, right? The kids need to be in that with their peers um, unless they, something about their disability means they need to pull out. And that can be just pulled out for an hour of reading, or it can be most of the day. But um, the IEP has to really defend that percentage of time. Um, this is just a visual because we love visuals. Um, least restrictive environment. So the least restrictive environment, obviously, is the gen ed classroom with their peers. And then a step down from that would be partial removal. So this is kind of like out to the resource room for reading or math or something. And then there's a self-contained classroom, which you probably most of you have self-contained classrooms in your schools. Um, the name is a little bit of a misnomer. Just because a student is in a self-contained classroom doesn't mean they can't be in the gen ed classroom at all, right? They can go back and forth. Um, and then there's a separate school, which would be like the special purpose private school. Um, there are special education residential programs and then hospital or homebound. So you could see there's a lot of steps in that continuum. All right. This is also a big deal. I guess everything is a big deal if I'm talking about it, because I'm just talking about the things that are a big deal. Um, so when, when the special ed department gets a referral, right, then they decide what eval evaluations they're going to do, and then the IEP team has to get together and um, look at those evals, and they have to fill out a very specific form that has very specific questions to determine whether that disability has an adverse effect on the child's um, access to the gen ed curriculum. And 
special education services for a child to qualify for special education, they require special education services. So that's a big deal. It's not they would benefit from special education services. That doesn't, that's not enough to qualify them. They have to require special education services to benefit from the general education curriculum. Related services, so this is your speech, OT, PT, social work, BCBA. Um, related services are required to assist the child to access their special education services. So special education services are to access general ed and related services are to access special ed and they need to be required. Would benefit from is not a thing. Required is the only thing. All right, questions about the basics. Yes, Lena, that is true. It's all a big deal. All right, no questions on the basics. We'll keep going. All right, so where does the gen ed teacher fit in? So we'll talk about the IEP team and IEP meetings. So I don't know if you're a law nerd. I don't know if there's any law nerds here at all, but um, there's a few words in laws, shall and must and may. Those are words that are in almost every law. So shall and must, if it says shall or must, you must do it, right? That's a thing. If it says may, then maybe you may do it. Um, so the IEP team, and this is right out of IDEA, who's the first member of the IEP team is the parents, right? They are pretty important. The second one, no less than one general education teacher, also very important. No less than one special education teacher and an SAU representative who, who is authorized to obligate the SAU. So this is your administrator who um, can say, yes, we will provide these services. We will pay for these services for this student. And then at the discretion of the parent or the SAU, Anybody else pretty much can be invited. So this, this is where your related service providers come in because they have special expertise regarding the student. Um, it could be a community case manager. It could be Aunt Susie. It could be anybody. Um, we need somebody who can evaluate, who can interpret evaluation results. So... Um, Students with IEPs need to be reevaluated and found eligible every three years. So typically a school psychologist will do an evaluation um, among others and they should be there to interpret the evaluation results, but it could be maybe the special ed teacher or um, administrator is able to do that. So it could be one of those other people. And whenever applicable, the child um, in high school, the child must always be invited to talk about their transition plan. So um, you could see that some of these people are shall, and some of them are kind of, you know, at the discretion of, or whenever applicable, or can also be one of the above. So it's those four are the minimum people that are part of the team. So. Gen ed teachers are a very important part of the team. All right, so why is it important for gen ed teachers to participate in the IEP meetings, right? What, why, why do you need to go? Well, the first answer is because the law says you have to. Um, not a great answer, I know, but this is how we live. Um, so, the gen ed teacher should participate in the development of the IEP, including determining appropriate behavioral interventions and other strategies, and figuring out those supplemental aid services, modifications, accommodations, right? They're in your room all the time. You know what they need. Oh. 
And who knows that child better than you, right? Um, this child is in school, they are in your classroom all day long. You know these kids, you know how they interact with their peers. You know how much support they need. Can they begin and complete tasks on their own, right? Does the task make a difference? Well, do they start math right away, but if they have to write something, they're wandering around the classroom. These are important observations, right? Are they able to transition between activities? Do they follow social cues, right? If your class is uh, sitting on the rug and all the students get up and go sit at their desk and this student is still sitting on the rug, they haven't picked up those social cues from their peers that they're supposed to be at their desk. Are they independent with their belongings? Can they gather materials for tasks? A lot of these will speak to um, functional needs and functional strengths and that kind of thing. So it is really important for you to be there because nobody else has this information. So what should you bring when you go to an IEP meeting? Work samples are always wonderful, grades, um, state or district assessment data, anecdotes. Um, so this is just an example of how an, an anecdote can be helpful. So the gen ed teacher said, hey, I had a few hokey stools, you know, those wobble stools. <coughs> Jimmy wanted to use one, but I thought it would be distracting. But I let him try it anyway. And wow, did it make a difference? And maybe the parent jumps in and says, oh yeah, he does his homework in the rocking chair. So then that brings up this whole conversation. Should we put it in as an accommodation? Should we collect some data on this to see um, if it's really helpful or not? Um, or when he would benefit from this accommodation? You just have to remember if the team decides to put it in the IEP, um, they have to put the um, frequency and location. And often for um, accommodations for frequency, we put as needed. So if a hokey stool is in the accommodations as needed, everywhere Jimmy goes, there needs to be a hokey stool available to him. So it might be better to kind of take some data and maybe in the accommodations it says hokey stool hokey stool during math class or something like that. And then it would only need to be available during math class. So there are other considerations around this. All right, accommodations and modifications. Let's get into that. All right, Accom an accommodation is a change in how the student is learning something. It does not change what they are learning in any way. So you have a seventh grader who's reading at a third grade level. He can go to social studies class and learn the same social studies everybody else is learning, but he struggles because he, he struggles to read that seventh grade text, right? So maybe he gets an audiobook. He's learning the exact same social studies curriculum. He's just getting it in a different way. He's using an audiobook instead of having to read the text. All right, a modification changes what the student learns. So this is where kind of your differentiation might come in, right? You're lowering the standards of the curriculum. Maybe um, the student has to answer fewer questions on the test. <coughs> Excuse me, maybe um, they don't have to write, they don't have to write essay questions. <clears throat> so that changes what they are learning or how they are being assessed. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are examples. Accommodations are how the student is getting the information. Modifications are changes what they learn. All right. <clears throat> excuse me, implementing the IEP. So you are part of this. This is part of IDEA. And again, you can click on that link. Um, 
So each SAU must ensure that the child's IEP is accessible. Look, who's the first person there? The gen ed teacher, special ed teacher. Anybody who works with this child should have access to their IEP. They should be informed of their specific responsibilities around implementing the IEP. And they should know which accommodations, modifications, and supports have to be provided when they are working with this student. So everyone who works with the student is really part of implementing the IEP. All right, so that's a lot. Questions about that? All right, I'm not seeing any, so I am going to move on. Discipline. Um, so this is a big subject, and there is a lot of detail in the law. The law really spells everything out, and it's very confusing. Um, I could talk about this for probably four hours, but I'm not going to. Um, I'm just going to give you the very, very basics on this. So the key is... After 10 days being removed, so this can be um, suspension. That's how people often think of it as suspension. But um, I know we have been out in schools and heard, well, he wasn't suspended, but he went home early. That's an informal removal. And yes, it counts. Um, it's this, it is a suspension. It just was done informally. So... After 10 days, not necessarily consecutive, any removal is considered a change of placement for that child. And a lot of things hinge on that when that change of placement happens. So at that time, um, and any time after those 10 days, services need to be provided to the student during any days that they are removed, right? So that 11th day on, services need to be provided. And you can see who has to decide what services are needed. Um, it's you, right? School personnel in consultation with at least one of the child's teachers determine the extent to which services are needed because they need to get those services to participate in the gen ed curriculum and their IEP goals. Um, if the SAU provides services to all students who are suspended all the time, they have to also do that for students with a disability. They can't wait the 10 days because that would not be fair or legal. That would be discriminatory, I guess is the word I'm looking for. All right, so this is also a tricky one. On the date on which the decision is made to make a removal that constitutes a change of placement, that is a mouthful. What that means, change of placement is those 10 days. So you have a student that has been suspended for seven days, right? And I know you're not making the decision um, unless there's administrators here, which I think there are, um, to do that removal, but so this is mostly an administrator thing, but um, so a student has been suspended seven, seven days, and then they do something that gets a five-day suspension, right? They're going to go over those 10 days. So on the date that that decision was made to do that five-day removal, so it's not 10 days yet, but we've made that decision, the SAU must notify the parents and provide the procedural safeguards. Procedural safeguards tell parents what rights they have um, under IDEA. And they have rights to file a state complaint. They can take the school to due process. They can ask for mediation. Um, so here you are handing that to the parent and saying, hey, by the way, this removal is gonna cause a change of placement. Here are your remedies. And then within 10 days of that removal, right? So the day you're, you're notifying the parent, you're giving them the procedural safeguards. Within 10 days of that day, 
there has to be a manifestation determination review. So there's an MDR team. It can be the IEP team. It might not be. Um, they need to review all the relevant information, right? What, what are the student's behavior issues? Is it the same thing all the time? Um, is it different but related? That kind of thing. Does that behavior have a direct and, st and substantial relationship to the child's disability? Or was it the direct result of the SAU's failure to implement the IEP? So remember, just a couple minutes ago, we were talking about who's responsible for implementing the IEP. It's everybody. So if the team decides, oh, well, this student had these accommodations or this in their behavior plan, and that wasn't being carried in music, so they always have a meltdown in music, the, the kid's coming back. They're coming back and the school has to um, address that failure to implement. All right. Um, so if the team determines that yes, this is a manifestation of the child's disability, and yes, we have implemented the IEP correctly, there must be a functional behavior assessment and a behavior plan. If there's already a behavior plan, the team has to review it and modify it to address this behavior. And the child must be returned to the placement from which they were removed. So they're coming back to your classroom. Unless as part of the modification of the behavior plan, the parents in the SAU agree to some kind of change of placement, but pretty much they're coming back. All right, questions about that very basic review. <laughs> Oh, you know, like a whole thing just on accommodations and modifications. That's a good idea. I just think it's the piece that general education teachers are asked to be more of a part of, right? The, right. the disciplinary piece, they wouldn't necessarily, that'd be more of an administrative team and an right. IEP team, but yep. a general ed, yeah, that's what I was just thinking that. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, any questions on discipline? All right, that's all I have. So um, we have resources that we always like to share. Um, procedural manual, this is just basically how to fill out forms and write an IEP. If you, um, you know, can't get to sleep one night, read the procedural manual, or even better, music. Um, if you're interested in special ed law, click on this link, get some user. It's a good read. And as part of Muser at the end is the procedural safeguards. So you can read that too. IP quick reference, probably don't need that. That's more for a special ed thing. People who write the IEPs, but we like to share anyway. These are links to our professional development calendar. We record everything we do and put it up on the website. Um, we have special education laws and regulations down there that'll bring you to all the things. Very cool, very fun. Um, Kelly, go get it. My fellow law nerd. These are our past office hours. Those links will bring you to the recording and these are the upcoming and those links will bring you to registration. Click this link or QR code, and we have a very short feedback form. We love feedback. We use it. Um, and you'll get a contact hour for coming to join us today. And we appreciate you coming to join us very much. So do we have any questions about any topics that I did not talk about? And I hope you do because that will help if we do this again, because we'll add them in. Oh, nothing in chat. 
Anybody want to be brave and come off mute? So I'll 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 be brave. Um, okay. I was hoping that I, I attended this presentation. Obviously, I didn't necessarily need to as a special right. administrator, but I wanted to see um, what I could steal from you folks in terms of presentations for my gen ed faculty, like helping them better understand their role. Uh -huh. So I, I came into it with wanting to know more about what the DOE would describe the role of gen, gen ed, the legality part of it, right? What, uh -huh. what they're legally bound to be a part of and you know um, the collaboration that needs to happen between gen ed and special ed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. And so I, I came in with a, a set expectation, obviously th that you didn't communicate that that's what it was gonna be, but I would love for a presentation to be designed around that. And, and as I said in, in my chat, that p big piece around, you know, a gen ed faculty member really needing to know when I look at an IEP, um, what parts of the IEP do I need to be responsible to and what does that look like for me and how do, how do I play that role well? Right, so. yeah. Good feedback. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions, but we are here and this is our contact information. Absolutely reach out as questions come up. Um, we are the modern and support team and we're all used to be special ed teachers. So we like to, we like the support part of our job better than the monitoring part. So feel free to reach out and there you go. Have a great afternoon and have a good vacation. <laughs>